Hello, friend. Hello. Well, one of you asked a really, really good question, which is, what does one do about children and technology? So, asking about how we work it with our girls. Smartphones, video games, any other tech. What's the relationship that we try to instill? So our basic philosophy as parents is that we really want to help our girls be able to make decisions for themselves, to be self-motivated and to feel good about the decisions that they make versus being kind of compliance-based parents where this is what we say and you do what we say and there are no questions, which oddly, I often feel <laughs> that with our method of asking them questions, getting their opinion, explaining our opinion, that there's a lot of respect and I feel as though our girls automatically want to participate in our family the way that we're hoping to. And people have told us in the past that we must have really strict rules in place because they watch our children and because we have grown up in a compliance-based culture, all of us, almost all of us probably, mm -hmm. then we automatically kind of project that if someone has good behavior, it has to be because there are lots of rules in place. However, you know, we've always gone by the philosophy with our forest monks at Rewild You that if I am going to create a super strict program that keeps them constantly being watched and their behaviors monitored, then when they leave, they're not going to have the intrinsic tools in place to continue those behaviors. It's one thing to have a drill sergeant shouting at you and making you do push-ups. It's another thing for you to be self-motivated mm -hmm. to do those push-ups yourself when nobody is telling you to do that. So as we move forward here, as Rebecca said, this is about an approach that isn't about trying to get compliance via compulsion because when we do that at least our view of the world is that you may get compliance from your child it may seem to work but at some point you know they're going to be doing stuff behind your back they learn that you're the authority figure you are not their friend you're the authority figure and then they're going to do stuff behind your back and eventually in the teens there's going to be a big rebellion and they're going to be pushing away from you I mean, our girls, if they do anything that they think might have <laughs> been, quote, wrong, they, they come, come and, and tell, tell us, us about it. So it's the opposite <laughs> yeah, of it's, being stuff behind that. It, it's really lovely. It does require commitment. And a lot of what we'll be talking about in this video requires an investment of your time, of your caring, of creating something that takes effort. You have to pay attention. You can't just coast on autopilot. Uh, however, the rewards for that are immense and really gratifying. So this is going to be a longer video and it's going to have some really good stuff in it. I think some pretty life-changing stuff as far as relationships go in your life. And it's not just about parents and children. All of this basically is going to also apply to your relationship with your partner, with your husband, wife, with parents, with and <laughs> with yourself. Yeah, as a lot of this will have to do with your own relationship to technology and other things in your life that have an influence over you. This video will actually be in two parts. The first part is going to talk about when we have children that maybe we're trying to decide how to introduce technology into their lives, how we do so, and how we can create a healthy relationship from the beginning, where part two is going to be about if your child is already addicted to technology. And at the end of part two, we're also going to have... We'll have an interview with our girls, yeah. so you can hear straight from them about their relationship with technology. So this technology issue is really important because it is a reflector, an indicator of your relationship with your child or your children or your spouse. However, in this video, it will be our or children. <laughs> yeah, and tech is really important because 
it is very distracting and it is all too easy for us to get sucked into tech, our children to get sucked into tech, and then for us to lose that interpersonal connection, which is really, really important. So in my opinion, the technology issue is really, truly a communication issue, a relationship issue. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. <laughs> it's, tech is this beautiful litmus test, basically, for us to get a marker on our relationships in our lives. Because basically what we're dealing with is a, a culturally sanctioned, it's normal, it's expected that everybody uses it, highly addictive drug. We're starting to learn how addictive these technology mediums are. And here we're talking about video games, we're talking about the smartphones, we're talking about television, we're talking about internet surfing. And social media. Social media, all these forms of, of tech basically, yeah. that we're interacting with. Well, what's interesting, I think of technology, because we're talking about technology with kids, it is like a drug. I think of it almost like sugar. And hmm. there's lots of different forms of it. And sugar isn't necessarily evil in and of itself. Like any drug or any tool, it can be good and it can be bad. It just depends on the hands of the user. And that's one of the things that's so important with kids and technology is because if I, as a grown up, and I confess to this right here, you can just, whatever the time is, just note it. Here's Rebecca's confession. I get sucked into technology too. If Me I sit too. down on the computer, I mean, people call it a rabbit hole. It certainly is. And I can suddenly look up and I've spent an hour figuring out, oh, isn't this cool? Look what I can do with permaculture. And then, wow, this person has a really neat looking fence. How do they make that? If I have trouble with that, then how much more challenging for a developing mind? The research shows that children's minds are really not equipped to deal with the level of addictive power coming in from this technology. So if I take a three, four-year-old kid and just hand them a smartphone or a tablet or whatever it is, I'm basically taking my kid and shooting them up with heroin. Their brains, their Filling bodies. Filling bottle with Mountain Dew. Yeah, yeah. They are not capable of dealing with the power of that addiction. And I've started them on a process that they will probably battle into adulthood of being addicted to this. Not being able to use it positively. Because again, because this is a culturally sanctioned thing, most of us, as you say, probably aren't going to go buy acreage up in Alaska. Yeah. And move out. <laughs> We're assuming in this video that you're watching this because you are going to continue having relationship with technology. You're not going to bug out and be done with civilization, much as many of us would wish to do that. So at some level, you, we will have technology. So in watching this, we're assuming you are agreeing to have technology in your life. And that is where the philosophy of being able to communicate about it and modeling for your children and helping guide them to have a healthy relationship where they're internally motivated, where they're conscious about their use, is super important because as you're saying, you start off that three, four-year-old, here, go ahead and watch movies all day long. You're not giving them any tools. And we don't want to take it away either and be like, no technology till you're 22, because then what do you do? It's the same as that Forest Monk program. It's great to have someone there saying, okay, push-ups, okay, run five miles. That's great, but then off you go and all of a sudden you're on your own. What do you do? Yeah. So like many things in life, it's not this clear black and white. If I just, if I give the child, sit them in front of the television, give them that tablet and boom, they're getting shot up with the heroin. But if I deny it completely, then they're not able to develop a positive relationship with it or that internal motivation that helps them to make positive life choices. We're leaving them basically completely unprepared mm -hmm. and then thrusting them at the age of 18 or whenever they move out into this world where they have to deal with this thing and they have no basis to deal with it. Well, let's face it. Kids are also going to go to their grandparents' houses. They're going to go to friends' houses. And I, for one, would like my child to have an understanding of what is going to be there. Same with food, okay? Anything that I am concerned about, I want to help them have a healthy relationship with. So what's involved in that? As with so many things in parenting, probably the very most essential thing is realizing that children learn less from us, from being told what to do, 
they learn more mm -hmm. from observing the people around, around them and mimicking that behavior. So what is most essential is that we as adults are modeling positive tech relationship behavior. Which basically means that we need to be self-aware and we need to be the adult in the situation for ourselves and be our big me, our best self, and notice, be honest, we have to have transparency. I am using the computer too much. I am texting in front of my kids even though I just told them not to. Now I am texting for 15 minutes to different people. We have to have an awareness of that. But I think the other important thing is that there's really kind of two kinds of technology. There's technology that is useful and furthers our relationships with each other or the world, and there's technology that distracts us from the world. Yeah, another way to think of that is technology that is educational in some way or enriching in some way, and technology that just entertains. Yeah. And that's probably hmm. time to talk about something that we've all grown up with as adults. Take for granted, pretty much. Yeah, as a, as a normal, regular thing in our world, and yet it's relatively new in human culture, and I don't think evolutionarily our brains are capable of dealing with it and it shows in how addicted we are into it and that is entertainment, entertainment. <laughs> and we so we had this discussion a while back and I we're not talking about sitting around the fire telling stories interacting with one another learning something about our culture or about the world we're talking about super flashy you know, blow up here and there movies and video games where you're getting all sorts of stimulation that we're really not necessarily built to deal with. Yeah, there's, I think there's a stimulation hypothesis, an overstimulation mm -hmm. hypothesis. I wish I knew who would put that forth. But you look at our ancestors, and life in nature is pretty darn peaceful. Mm -hmm. Then there's a saber tooth. Everybody gets up, we grab our spears. What? There's a lot of intensity for a short amount of time, and then things are peaceful again. So that is the general way of things. Now, when we, let's say we're going to work, it's stressful. I come home from work, my brain feels stressed, and I think I've got to get away from that stress, so I watch, let's say, the latest Avengers movie, and boom, what that does is it creates more stimulation, more stress in my mind. I'm conditioning my mind over and over yes. into this high, high stimulation level. This is basically what entertainment does. So different than sitting around the campfire, having, let's say, the elder tell stories. It's a slow-paced, enriching, connected sort of thing. The entertainment is designed to trigger parts of our brain that get us excited, sad, mm -hmm. scared. These high Bah, brrr, really <laughs> high energy emotions that keep our minds super high and then that creates something else in our modern culture which probably I can guarantee did not mm -hmm. exist back then that is the sensation of boredom being bored yeah which is really challenging you can see how we've started to set it up for ourselves I just want to jump in and say this is not to say that everybody should stop watching movies we should stop having entertainment but as we talk along in this video, we're talking about being aware of what we're doing, being aware of shooting up with that drug or taking in a bunch of sugar. And we've talked before about junk food for your brain and just being aware of it. Um, I think we should talk about boredom and what some of the students have experienced out here at Ewald University. Oh yeah. So that sense of boredom, you may have seen, I did an old video on this and said so that basically boredom is the sensation of our mind slowing down. Now a slower mind is actually a more capable mind. A highly revved mind mm -hmm. is just incapable of taking in more information. It's, it's staticky. A slow mind is aware, it's open, it's capable. But to go from that staticky mind to a slower mind there's a sensation. Just as when I do push-ups, there's a sensation of pain or soreness in the muscles. There's a sensation of my brain coming to a higher level of awareness, and that is the sensation of boredom. 
that boredom is painful. We want to relieve the pain. So most of us will intake entertainment, mm -hmm. which relieves that pain of the boredom and conditions my mind to more easily become bored. You see the cycle and how this works. Entertainment is not innocent. It actually is actively conditioning our brain into a higher static level, creating the sensation of boredom. And that is part of what gets us so addicted to the movies, to the video games, to any of the tech, to the social media. Which is all to say that as we are going along thinking about what we want for ourselves and for our children, we need to realize these things. We need to realize and recognize, oh, I'm having boredom. That is a byproduct of what I've been training my brain because everything we do trains our brain. So recognizing that not as something bad, but almost as something good. In a way, it is the detox of yeah. entertainment from your system, which is a signal that you are on the right path to a healthy relationship with technology. But your kids might get super bored too, especially <laughs> if they're already addicted. If not, yes. then we have a different way to approach things. Now we use technology in our life and- A lot. Technology yes. is very I mean, present. Hi, <laughs> we're using technology here. Uh, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the ways in which we use technology with our girls. One thing that we do is we homeschool. And so we will use technology. You might even hear the girls talk about it later in the video for learning math, for physics, for all sorts of different things. There are lots of great resources and it's really, really fun. And they learn a lot and I'm really <laughs> grateful for it. We do limit that time. No matter what we do, we realize all time with technology is time with technology. And so we have to balance that by getting out into nature uh, and doing things as a family, connecting person to person. We have an old cell phone that has a photo program on it. And we allow Liliana, who's very interested in the natural world, to use that as a camera, especially so she can take pictures of butterflies and bugs and come back home and ID them later on. Now, this positive relationship with technology that we're trying to develop is, it's tough, again, because this is such an addictive medium. And you used words like, allow her. Mm -hmm. and we give them a certain amount of time. And what we're talking about here, I mean, that language is built into our, yeah. into our consciousness. But the way we actually do that and use that is, is not about here's the rule, right. but is about recognizing that this is such a powerful, addictive substance that we need each other mm -hmm. to help us to move through it and develop those positive relationships. So I will be on the computer getting sucked into emails and maybe then checking out the state of the virus thing and, and maybe then checking into some politics and boom, and I can get sucked away into it. So I rely in many ways on Rebecca and on the girls mm -hmm. to keep an eye on me, to monitor me a little bit and to help me with that awareness because I recognize that I am not yet self-aware or self-disciplined, powerful enough mentally to have this positive relationship just on my own. So technically, we allow Kenton to have a certain amount of time <laughs> on the computer. And I use that word, but what's behind it is a whole discussion, actually multiple different discussions as a family about technology. So there isn't just a laying out of rules. When I say allow, Liliana knows, the girls know, it is easy to get sucked in. They've seen it happen to us. They've had it happen to themselves. And so we have all agreed as a family on certain time frames, on certain ways that we have a relationship with that technology. And so I might, if the girls are going to say, do this musical thing online that they like to do where they get to craft music and learn about rhythm and all of that, they might ask that and I might say, oh right, well, could we set the timer for this? And they'll say, yes. Well, I'll say, okay, you girls can have 20 minutes to do this. That was agreed upon. That is not my rule. That is our rule as a family. And that's something that I highly recommend that you do with your family is to get an idea of where everybody's at with technology and say, we need to support each other. 
So that is circling around to what we talked about in the beginning, that this is not so much about what are the rules going to be. This is about developing a relationship of mutual respect with yourself, with your whatever your family is, and specifically here, with your children. And that can be very foreign in a culture which teaches that adults are in charge, children are submissive and need to do what we say. I mean, we have that with husband and wives in some aspects of our, of our culture. And certainly we have it, even for people that disregard that, a lot of people think, well, the parents are in charge and children darn well should do what the parents say. But this, to us, again, is a golden opportunity for creating a super positive, respectful relationship. So the essence here is not to play adult to child, just you're the boss, but instead to sit down as a family and start developing this new kind of relationship. Which essentially means that you want to get everybody at the table, devices away, <laughs> and talk about and it's going to be different for every single family. Talk about it. For example, with us, we work from home. We do these videos as part of our, our livelihood. That has to be taken into consideration. Where do we put that within our life? How does it affect everybody? It's important to hear a lot of times if Kenton or I are on the computer too much, we'll see that reflected in our family dynamics. And so we can call a little circle up and get the girls' opinions, and they might say, yeah, I miss when we would do more foraging, more this, more that. It's a check-in. It's good to have check-ins. And so as a family, you want to decide what's important to you. It's probably going to come down to family being a priority versus tech being a priority. It doesn't mean you can't have tech in your life. We still watch movies once in a while. Not a whole lot, because actually the girls want to watch movies less than we do. You want to talk about each thing. If someone has a problem with texting, you might want to say, hey, I've noticed this. Would you feel that that's true? You want to tell me about that a little bit more. And that will come into play more with children who are addicted, with getting to hear what they're using their technology for. But making a plan as a family for how you're going to interact with that technology in your life. And then everybody being on the same page with it and helping each other out with it. I think it's good to find the ways and list the ways in which your family can use technology positively, whether that's educational or you might be using it to Skype grandma who lives 500 miles away and don't see her all the time. What are the different positive ways you interact with technology? And then where are your sticking points and what can you do to help each other with that? There's two main tools that you can use to establish these kinds of communications, these kinds of talks, conversations. And the one is validation. Mm. The other one is the power of listening. Those probably are their own videos, but very <laughs> briefly, listening is accomplished by not trying to, when you're in a conversation, so your child is saying something to you, not latching on to something they say as they're speaking and then starting to think in your own mind how you can counter that and tell them that they're wrong. But instead, just listening without letting your mind jump in to everything they have to say. And then asking more questions mm -hmm. about what they say to further understand it. So that listening is vital. Otherwise, there's no communication going on. It's just people talking at themselves. I want to jump in and say when I'm listening to someone, I like to imagine that afterwards, and often I try to do this, that afterwards I am going to paraphrase back to them and say, all right, I have heard that you're saying this. Is that true? Do I have that right? And then I can give them a chance to say, yeah, you get me totally, or yeah, that's true, except for this one part. And so instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to retaliate with this, I think, how, how will I tell them back what I've heard? Do I really understand what they're saying? And that's a good practice because then you really have to focus on what they're saying. Validation, you can probably speak to better than I can. But validation is when your child says, you know, well, I really love this video game. It's not saying, well, that video game is bad for you and it's rotting your brain out. <laughs> it's saying, wow, I can understand. There's been some things that I have really loved in my life too. 
maybe weren't the best for me, but I really felt drawn to them. So I can understand where you're coming from. Tell me more about what you like about this game. What draws you to it? That is validating somebody. Then they will open up more and more. So we're creating a culture of openness mm -hmm. and communication. That's really the only way that you're going to be able to come to a, a way of talking as a family where you can make these decisions together to say, limit time on the computer. Yeah, it's really important to connect. And we have to realize that, especially with children who already have a deep relationship with technology that may be unhealthy, that there may be periods where they are going to resent you, where there is going to be strong feelings. And you have to realize that you need to be able to be open to that and to validate them and say, it's okay. I understand you might not like me right now. I understand this might be hard. I can understand that. You have a right to your feelings. And that's essentially what validation is. It doesn't say, I totally agree with you. It says, you have a right to feel that way. Okay, before we move on to part two of this video, a couple of tips just to throw in at the end here. And one is to use technology to start to kind of urge ourselves and our children towards aspects of technology that are more connected, connection-based. Yeah, so instead of texting, using the phone to call someone or using, there's a Marco Polo app right now, that's a video, kind of a video texting, you get to see people. Skyping, getting together in person is always really awesome. Finding ways to use educational tools of technology. If you're gonna watch a movie, knowing you have the power to stop and discuss it. So pick those things wisely and consciously. I think the, the other side of this is to find non-tech ways to get your kids involved yeah. in learning about things, job shadowing, volunteering, going to the library, asking people that you know about things that they're interested in and making sure you have family time that's completely away from technology, getting out, doing things together that are fun for your kids and yourself. To sum section one up here, we are really talking about not laying down rules, but about establishing a new kind of relationship with ourselves, our loved ones. So we're looking at, as ourselves, modeling healthy technology use for our children and people around us. We're looking at being aware of using technology, and being conscious that we're using it, and how we're going to use it. That's really, really important. And maybe you need to set up some special things for yourself. Maybe you need to have a docking station for all your technology. If you have trouble because it's easy to keep your cell phone on you and say, I'm going to keep my phone at the docking station. All family members keep their technology at the docking station. And we're going to each check our phone four times in a day. Okay, so that's just one example of a way to solve a certain issue. So getting together. Sorry, I was texting somebody. <laughs> Getting together as a family and making a plan and realizing that you can alter that as you go along. So to have check-ins. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way because understanding the, again, the addictive power hmm. of these things. And I benefit, I think, a lot because I have so much computer work to do with the videos, the editing, comments, everything else. When my family helps me by saying, you know, Dad, it's really nice if you set aside a certain time when is your work time. Mm -hmm. So if from, you know, 9 to noon and then we're going to have an hour together, and then some more hours here and whatever those hours are going to be throughout the day so that they are kind of set in the same way they would be if I was going to work. Mm -hmm. And then that pulls me out of it and it also encourages me to use the tech wisely instead of just going off into, mm -hmm. you know, the la, rabbit hole la, land la, la, of the internet that, oh my gosh, well, it's so easy to pull you in. One other tip while I'm thinking of it is just to get people's expectations, I'm going to say lower people's expectations. I don't mean that in a negative way, but I do mean, if it's good if people don't expect you to text back within 30 seconds of them texting them. Hey, if you text tomorrow, that's great. If you email tomorrow or two days from now, no big deal. Start to set that standard so that you have a little free time. Remember, you don't have to answer your phone. You don't have to respond to a text or a social media right away. You don't have to post on Instagram every single gosh darn day. Take a little bit of time to, I want to say, sort of cultivate love and protect what's really essential, which is that relationship. So it all comes down to cultivating that relationship 
with the people in your life and with technology so that you can have that deeper relationship with the people in your life. And, and that brings up the last thing, which is that technology and our use of technology fills up our time. Oh my gosh. It really does. So and much. We get sucked into that rabbit hole. I mean, that is a real reality. People will play video games. We used to have a stage in our life where we played video games four hours we would look up and we'd say oh my gosh we spent three hours playing it felt like about 30 minutes so the beauty is that when you start to shape and change how you are with technology and especially as you start to scale it down something's got to fill that time and what does you said what's essential back there mm. and that's what can fill it because when you're not using technology, first of all, remember, your brain will go into boredom mode here. Yeah. But it's essential that you fill that space and that boredom with something positive. Now, if you're a monk and you're on your own, that can be meditation. You can go right into the boredom and fill your <laughs> space with meditation. But as a family, you can suddenly realize, oh my gosh, now we have three, four hours a day that just were gone before sucked into technology when we can go and oh my gosh there's so many fun things you can do as a family visit the natural history museum go to the library go for a bike ride go for a swim and as part of your sitting down and your technology talk one great thing to do which i guess i didn't mention before is to list people's interests to say hey if we didn't have this technology say the internet crashed and electricity was gone for the next three months what are some cool things we would love to learn or do and have that list and then say oh my gosh guys we're not going to spend our movie night watching a movie what do you want to do instead and say oh, let's go to the observatory and look at the stars we wrote that down let's do it yeah. and actually make a point of doing some of those things that are are interesting that you want to investigate and then you have this rich rich life of all these memories of being together and you get to learn all these wonderful things meet new people such a great oh, treasure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is waiting on the Amazing. other side of that tech addiction and we don't recognize it because the entertainment aspect of tech is so just pulls our mind in but it doesn't really fill us up. Mm. When you build a, a kite with your children, mm. or you buy some shinai and you all practice sword fighting together, or plant a, garden. plant a garden, go catch some bugs. There are a thousand, thousand things you can do, no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. I remember as a kid, so you could be in a little apartment in the city, and if you just have a roll of string, you could turn the whole apartment into a spider web by <laughs> stringing that web all and over try and going to go up through, and through it. it. Yeah. There are so many different things to do. Millions and millions. In fact, your imagination is the limit. And that's one of the beautiful things that happens after you detox from entertainment and technology. You go through the boredom. Your imagination and creativity begins to have a place where it can grow and blossom, which is so, so incredible. It's amazing to see what comes out when you get to set technology aside. And I wanna hear from all of you out there who are watching this. If you've stayed through this long, wow, awesome. You are, <laughs> you are a champion. In my mind, you are a hero because you are trying to help create a world where technology can be healthy, it can be used in a healthy, positive way. And I wanna hear from you where you're struggling or if you have questions or how you have found ways to use technology positively or what you do with your time instead of technology. I really want to hear about that. So please, please share and then join us for part two where we're going to talk about if you've got people, especially children who are already addicted, how do you take that approach to moving to a healthier way of living with technology? If you're watching this one, it just was uploaded. We will try to have that part two up within a couple days at the most. So we'll be on it. Thank you for coming along this journey. Thank you for those of you out there who have asked us for this information. It's a really, really important dialogue that I think we need to start having as a culture. And so I am glad that we are breaking ground on this together. It's so awesome. So thank you so, so much for being a part of this with us. <laughs> Loved you all. Talk with you in the comments.